Welcome to this very special series brought to you by Straight to the Source and Food South Australia with support from the Department of Trade and Investment. We're coming to you today from the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and we'd like to begin by paying our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. We've taken our studio on the road to Adelaide, where we're catching up with 10 exciting producers from regions across South Australia to find out what puts them at the forefront of creativity and innovation in food production. It's been really fantastic to spend time in South Australia over the last few days. It's really reinforced the diversity that's on offer here and the outstanding quality across the board. You can feel the connection and collaboration between producers and it's really wonderful because it makes them so much stronger together. Yeah, we've had we've had and heard some fantastic conversations with producers over the last few days and we're really looking forward to sharing their stories with you. And it's been mighty delicious. <laughs> Let's get started. Welcome, Roberto. It is so nice to be here. We've spoken so many times and Cucina Classica is a range that you are just going from strength to strength and we are really looking forward to hearing your story and to be here in situ in South Australia is even a bigger bonus. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. What a beautiful, beautiful name that is. Can you give us some background as to give us the elevator pitch of your business and what that name means for you? Wow. It's, um, the name actually evolved um, from our restaurant in 1996 called Chibo Restaurante, which turned into a local franchise coffee chain of about 20 stores. Um, and then Cucina Classica kind of came back to us. Um, it was like the restaurant's gift of giving. It kind of takes us back to our roots of uh, four partners, you know, one, a chef um, from Italy um, who, who's Calabrian but learnt all of his cooking skills in Tuscany, um, another chef, uh, you know, first-generation Italian uh, born here, um, and he um, went to Italy to learn to be a pastry chef and went to Sicily and, and worked with his, his friends there. Um, and uh, another uh, one, Angelo, who my cousin, him and I grew up together and always thought we'd be in business together one day, which we did. Um, and um, he was just a crazy barista, um, really, because of his father was a barista uh, from Italy. Um, and uh, and then myself, um, you know, brought up in delicatessens all of my life. Got a bit of a taste for restaurants when I was 18 and never, ever left. Um, and much to my father's disgrace of not ever going back to do the family business, um, and he was pretty proud in the end of uh, where I got to, which was, which is amazing. Um, and really the four of us coming together was four different skill sets, you know, and my skill set was really the people, the networks, the front of house, and managing the teams of people and bringing the ideas together of the rest. And you grew up in South Australia? Yeah. Okay. And my mum's Australian, so I probably was given a bit of a gift because all my partners were either from Italy and Italian or that first Italian in Australia from their parents and really caught up in that real strict Italian tradition, whereas my mum was a pretty gutsy lady and, um, you know, she would question anything, um, even though she did become Italianized, and we, you know, thank her for doing that because it helped us, but... You know, I I had roast Sunday roast on Wednesday night. Right. You know, I had lamb's <laughs> fry. Bit of a disruptor. Lamb's fry on Thursday. <laughs> I would have, you know, on Sunday nights we were allowed to have toasted cheese and Vegemite sandwiches. So we kind of like understood a lot about Australian culture. Um, and you know, in going into this first business together with my partners, I think what I brought to the table was basically, even though I loved all things Italians and I wanted to be Italian, um, I had this secret advantage advantage of knowing Australian culture and what Australian people want. So it really made it easy for me to go into those steps of marketing because I, whereas with Italians, they come here, it's like, this is the way it is. That's how we cook it, that's how you eat it, and you shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whereas Australians are like, no, hang on, I can have whatever I want in the world. You can't tell me what to do. <laughs> so how old were you when you set off with your first business? Um, well, I was 18 
And just uh, over eight, nearly 19 when I left mum and dad's business and went to work for Rigoni's mm -hmm. and I started there as a glass washer and by the age of 21 I'd worked my way up to manage the restaurant and was invited to be a shareholder in with the other waiters and the owner of the restaurant. At 21? At 21 and... And we opened a restaurant called Kayon's Fish Restaurant, named after Jukondo Kayon, the owner, in the same street as Rigoni's. And um, it didn't go so well at first. And um, In what way? It just didn't fire. It, just, right. it was called, actually, it was called the Fisherman's Basket. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> why. <laughs> and then eventually uh, Jukondo said, well, I'll throw my name behind it to help. And, and at that stage I put my hand up and said, hey, can I have a go? at taking this and see if I can rebuild it. And uh, so, yeah, went into that restaurant. Yeah, I was 21 and had no idea really what I was doing. And I, But what I was good at was actually I hired people that knew what they were doing. So I had an amazing chef, um, Robert Etzler, um, amazing waiter and Carl Dipple, who, you know, worked with Chong at Nettie's and, and Terry, another, you know, great um, uh, well-known waiter in Adelaide, um, John Gable as, as an apprentice chef then. Now he's a he's a you know an amazing chef here in Adelaide. Um, and so built this team and from that team we just kind of, you know, went to the basics and uh, and we built a really amazing restaurant. I mean, when I first got there, I think we were losing something like sixty thousand a year. It was probably back in nineteen eighties, late eighties, I think it was. And um is that right? Yeah. And then I um um, with the help of all this team and the people, you know, the next year um, we made a $90,000 profit and then it became this really little cool fish restaurant in Adelaide and that was probably my real first success in being a restaurateur. And then after that, um, with the same uh, group, we opened Grimaldi's at uh, Burnside, which was just a really amazing European cafe in 1992. Um, and... Once again, I was given I was uh, given the the reins to run that one, but I didn't realise how hard it was going to be because um, I hadn't really opened from scratch. And so, I remember in December before Christmas, we were running Kayon's Fish Restaurant under management with with Carl, and I was running Rigoni's up the road and overseeing it. And um, he came in and said, "Oh, it's Christmas. I'm going on holidays." And Jukundo said, "Yeah, sure, you're going on holidays. Not a problem." And I said, "Well, hang on, we're." building a restaurant in you know over christmas you know, we've got workers going in december middle oh you'll be fine and then about the december the 20th or 18th the last friday of the rush of the christmas he just said i'm going to kangaroo island for two months and i thought well, who's going to build the restaurant he said, well, everything's done plans builder knows what to do you just got to make sure it happens and that was probably my first experience of having to fully open a uh, a cafe restaurant. We got it open by, uh, I think it was early Feb, late Jan. So what would be some advice you'd give your younger self? Not drive so fast. $2,000 in speeding fines in oh. two in eight weeks from going back and forth. And the same camera just kept on getting me. <laughs> it was, that was definitely the... Yeah. Tough lesson. Yeah, it was a tough lesson. Yeah. Then what then? Um, and then after uh, that, you know, I, I was in charge of running three restaurants um, with the help of uh, Jacundo and his wife, who was amazing. She really taught me a lot about how to pay bills and, and wages. Was and, she a mentor? Yeah, I think, you know, she was a, she was quiet, but she actually did a lot. I actually learned a lot from her. Mm -hmm. You probably don't realise it until afterwards, but she was quite a special person um, that helped me. And then, um, unfortunately, I... Um, wanted to do more mm -hmm. and you know Jugondo was in his 50s and he didn't you know and Maria they didn't want to do anymore they've done the hard yards and and so I decided to leave one day which was really unexpected by you know even my wife to be then and my family and my everyone just couldn't believe it you know? and Jugondo just asked me a question one day and he said oh, I hear you're thinking of not buying into the whole because we're all going to buy more into the group and, mm -hmm. and I said no I don't I think I'm going to do it. And he said, why not? And I said, oh, well, I don't know what to do that much. It kind of limits me. I kind of like can't really go do something else. I, you know, I really want to do some new things. Yeah, but this is a big opportunity for you. You must be crazy, you know. And, uh, and I said, well, actually, I'm not happy. And you told me if I'm not happy, I shouldn't do it. So I'm not happy. I'm not going to do it. Well, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to leave. 
I quit. <laughs> and that was it. I went back to play tennis with my wife and uh, my future wife and just, just had a day going. I said, yeah, I just quit. What? <laughs> and then next minute. Um, did you uh, give yourself a bit of a break then? No, it just happened really fast. Mm-hmm. I actually did um, have a Chikondal's friend, Philip Zapier, who was a mentor for me, um, who had restaurants in Adelaide from the 60s, similar to Chikondal, through to... Um, well, through to the 2000s. Um, and um, he used to come and visit me at Grimaldi's when I was working there and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? You know? I said, oh, just kind of, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. I can't do what this. And, but he was always trying to convince me to stay. Um, and so then he walked in the Sunday morning after I'd quit and I said, I've left, I've resigned. He said, what have you done that for? Dragundo's going to kill me. I'm his friend. And, you know, and we won't hit it. It's true. They never talked after that. Oh, God. <laughs> so, but from that moment, I got to meet Patrick Faruja, crazy Adelaide developer at that time, who basically did own most of Rundle Street before it got sold off um, to um, the Maris family. And um, we owed, he owned one side, they owned the other. And... Um, uh, through that, we did uh, Scuzzi in Rundle Street, which is this 240-seater sort of modern-day cafe eatery, one of those ones where you line up and order and sit down. And But we were just ahead of the curve. We just did things that were a bit more special and it was went, went nuts. Did you get inspiration from travelling? or? Yeah, no, it came after, really. So, okay. yeah, yeah, so I did get inspiration from travelling, but then it wasn't until... Um, did I did a bit of travel with Scuzzi and that was good and that's where I got my inspiration for Chibol the restaurant. But um, when we got into Chibol the restaurant, um, my wife and I off our own back would travel every five to six months to Italy and we just did sometimes 10 days or 18-day short trips and they were just action-packed, um, lonely planet. <laughs> because you didn't have the internet as much, you know, sat in a little GPSs and we would just get a car and just drive to restaurants and cafe bars as many as we could that we knew were open and were hot in Rome especially. So you just mentioned you just touched on Chibos. Let's talk about Chibos because, um, you know, that was quite a unique offering. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was just it was a contemporary Italian restaurant that just brought the now, mm. obviously – Instead of the old stereotype of Italy. Well, I remember it was years ago and I, I went to, um, I came down to Adelaide and a friend of mine said, let's go to Chibos for coffee and Bailey's. And I went, what? It's a cafe. They have Bailey's? <laughs> we went there and it was like 10 o'clock at night. And we had a coffee and Bailey's and I went, this is fantastic. Yeah. You know, I felt like I was back in Milan. Yeah. Well, it, that, and that was that we wanted to transport people back. You know, and the whole, um, the, the proud, you know, when you have your proud moments of what you do. And you kind of like, no, you've success. What mm. what success for us was when Italians would walk in and go, Oh my God, I could be in Italy. Mm. And and that's basically what drove everything. It drove how we our recipes, the menus, everything we developed. Service. Service. It was all about doing that whole, you know, what in Italy. And back then, you know, we had um it was in Melbourne when uh, Maurizio Terzini opened up uh, Cafe Cucina. Mm. You know, it was roughly the same time. Um, but he was another inspiration, like really, you know. And Salvatore, one of the partners, you know, he knew him, he'd worked with him in some shape or form, became friends with his partner, Mario. And, you know, you just, it was a time where Italian was, it was like the real Italian came to Australia. And so anyone that tried to be Italian in that time, it wasn't just doing a bolognese, you, mm. know, mm-hmm. you know. And you couldn't call it a bolognese. If you did, you'd call it a ragu and, you know, and, uh, you, know, and you wouldn't put um, – you, know, you, you just wouldn't do it how we did it. <laughs> and you wouldn't do alla panna. And you, you know, anything that was like associated with the past stereotype Italian kind of uh, ways of the 70s and 80s was distant. You know, doing pasta with crab and um, – uh, you know, pasta crab with cream and tomato and chili was a first. Mm. You know, no one was doing it. It was amazing. You know, it became, and it still is, a signature dish for us today in our Cucina Classica range. So when you sold, how long ago was that that you sold Chibos? And how, so, many, how many cafes did you have at the time? So, yeah, so Chibos kind of like we started the restaurant in 96. We sold yeah. that 10 years later. 
uh, without the name. And then we, in that, from 2000 to 2012, we grew to 20 stores of Chibo Espresso and then we sold that. Um, with the name. With the name. And then we um, uh, still manufactured all the and supplied all the food for the stores until late last year in October. And but meanwhile, we're being really focused on our Cucina Classica brand, which is getting back to our roots of where we came from as a restaurant. Um, our partnership over 25 years has pretty much moved on now, and you know we're really grateful for the times and all the skills that we learned for each partner that brought to this business because it created the foundation. And uh, today we're very lucky that one of those partners, Salvatore, has come back to set up his pasta-making facility inside of our kitchen here, and he's going to be making all the pasta for our meals um, in the supermarkets that we sell our ready meals, mm-hmm. and and our products will go to 99% Australian made. That is fantastic. Yeah. Now let's talk about your ready meals. Yeah. So this they just kind of... Um, I think we were like really ahead of the curve at that time to do it. 2011, I think we started doing it. And we had this skill set here. We could make cakes, you know, we could make pastries. We, could make, we were making the best bombolones. We were making gelati cakes. We were making great gelati, sfogliatelles, ricotta cannoli. We were, you know, and then we made, we had all these recipes from the restaurant. We were making pasta. Even back then at Ready Mills, we were doing osso buco. Um, and um, it was just this sort of like we had all this kitchen with all these things that we could do. And then we just sort of got everyone saying, oh, these ready meals, and it was going crazy in the UK at that time. And we started doing the pasta meals and and we just wanted to kind of do a, once again, do a meal that, you know, you put in a microwave and serve up to the Italian and go, oh, my God, this is really good. <laughs> How'd you do that? <laughs> You know, and it is. It's, it's sometimes it's really ridiculous that you know people just wouldn't know this has come out of a microwave. Well, I mean, you talk about authenticity, and that's very important to you, isn't it? Yeah. And then you know you're making Italian cuisine, but you're using Australian ingredients, and you're you're still doing it all by hand. Yeah, we are. It's, uh, it's but it's convenient. Yeah, very. Yeah, and it's and and that's what we do. We kind of like bring that convenience into your home right now, just a bit more of that stylish Italian. Well, I've got to say, you just you just gave Lucy and I a tour of the facility and and walking us through um, and looking at all those Australian ingredients that you're using. I mean, in the pizza itself. Yeah. Well, we do a great South Australian uh, pizza that's 100% South Australian producers. So we have our originale pizza, which has uh, salami from Marino's. Uh, we have ham from Barossa Meats uh, or Barossa Fine Foods, sorry. We have our cheese from La Casa del Formaggio. You know, and that's a great relationship because my father used to go to that shop to buy all his cheese when they first started a little shop in Glind, and now they're this amazing national cheese making company. Um, um, we've got uh, mushrooms from SA Mushrooms, which is another great story in South Australia, who make the best mushrooms. They grow amazing mushrooms. We've actually taken groups of chefs out there to it's South Australian eat. mushrooms. Very good. And then, you know, and we, I can't even think of it. Cheese. We make, obviously, the sourdough base because we have a 160-year-old mother dough that we make our pizza base from and we make our sauce for that. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just a great collaboration to be able to be working. Lauki Flour. You know, it's just really great to see. And all these South Australian brands are on the pizza label. Uh, the, and the logo, our logo is on there just like theirs, but the brand's called Great South Aussie Pizza. Well, what are some of the goals or projects that are in the pipeline that are really exciting at the yeah. moment? Yeah, look, uh, the biggest thing that um, since I took over running the kitchen two years ago, I probably the biggest thing for me was actually how we just, because we knew we weren't going to supply the Chibo stores anymore and how we could actually just focus on our brand or things that we could do in food manufacturing. And, um, you know, one thing we hadn't really nailed is going national with our meals and our products. And this is just about to start. So we're, you know, we spent the last, well, I've spent the last two years learning a lot. Food SA have been a big driver of opening up my mind to what is available to me. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't really been talking to them much in the last few months because I've been so busy with all the things they helped me with. Like they've just connected me and helped me understand how to get to market. Um, Big, big driving, big driving programs that they do that I used to think I'm not going to network, I don't need to do that, it's a waste of time, I haven't got the energy. And the thing I did this time was I came into this business and just went, 
I need to be open to everything. And that was the first thing that came my way and it was the, it was the best thing, just the best thing. And then from that, you know, Department of Trade, you know, have also been in a massive help for us. So they've introduced me to Heather Mills, who's like Paul McCartney's ex-wife, you know, and she's like on Skypes with me for about six months back and forth over how they can enter and, you know, do things with them in Australia and the South Australia and using South Australia as their base and, you know, and learnt a lot from her as well around the vegan food side. Um, and then also at the same time, um, we got connected with Modern uh, Meat in Canada and, you know, really authentic vegan brand that makes vegan food that not only tastes good, but it's good for you. Is but, that where you want to go? Is that well, a direction? Well, I, def- I think it's a – I don't, th- I don't think we have a choice. I think we're all going – we're going to have to go that way. It's, you know, I think the prices of proteins are just going to go through the roof and we're going to get really clever – at how we produce alternative proteins that are actually good for you. So really looking forward. Um, we did a deal with them last year to manufacture their products for Australia. Um, we've been a bit slow this year, but we also got introduced by Department of Trade to Renourish, which is the hottest and fastest and biggest selling soup in the UK at the moment. Um, Tell us about that. Well, that is, it's just amazing. We met in, I think, late January. Um, only about eight weeks or six weeks ago, um, the owner and, and her chief operation, Nikki and Karen, flew out and spent four days with us just to go through the recipes. And then, you know, you just got to pinch yourself. Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> well, it, it sounds to me that you've got different funnels, right? So you're building um, – Kachina Classica is definitely putting South Australian producers yeah. on the map and your products by selling them nationally. You're getting South Australia out there, but you're also – getting your brand out there yeah, in, well, in a broad sense. But then you're also doing contract manufacturing yeah. for, for products that are in align with your values. Yeah, and, and look, we've, we've always been doing things handmade and really this level of production cannot be sustained without automation. Yeah. And it's not big steps, it's big steps for us. Mm. And it's quite an expense. So what I had to think of when I automate things and do things, how can I extrapolate that over more production for other people to help us help build our business and grow our business whilst we're growing our brand nationally and, and, and use this, and this is being used probably as a base by other companies to help them, you know, if we can secure scale these up. contracts for three to five years to help us do that, to scale up and help them scale up. If we go on in the future together, great. But if we don't, the great thing about this business is that we've still retained our brand and yes. we haven't, and we won't leave that secondary. That's actually the core of where we're going, you know. And from that, you know, we got introduced um, um, to the Botanical Hotel Group and uh, the hotel in in Melbourne, and they got they've been because of COVID been doing their own ready meals for home, but can't keep up. And they're going to go national. Um, and so they're another customer that we're taking on and we'll be making their food under their recipes to go out to all of Australia for them as well. Um, and that's, it's, that's just been an absolute, you know, and they're, they're, all the people we're using are people that are aligned with, you know, everyone says, oh, we're a quality product, um, we do this, <laughs> you know, we're authentic, we're artisan. We're... The, the truth is we just love really good things. And if there's people that want us to do things for them and think that same way, well, they're, we're, we're so lucky we've met already three different types of businesses that have the same sort of way of thinking, which is great. Well, collaboration yeah. collaboration's key, isn't it? It is. And you're collectively you're stronger together as long as you don't lose sight of your yeah. core brand, exactly. which clearly you haven't. Well, no, I hope not, do you? So are you planning on going more into food service or are you going to stay in the retail game? No, I think we'll go more re- – I think we'll stay more retail. Okay. Look, we can do food service, but I'm just I kind of like um, – I like the freedom of being able to create products for, for people. I, I like, you know, that validation that, hey, that's a – you know, we did a casa de che melanzane, which is, for me is just a great dish. And, and it's vegan by default. <laughs> Can you explain what it is, please? So casareche is just these twi- like little tubes twisted together of pasta and the melanzane sauce is a la norma, which is the eggplant and tomato and basil and chili salsa. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just you know something that we have every summer and it's really good. Um, and um, no, just, it's just, just great to see 
we took that product and we didn't have to interfere with it really to make it vegan. And so it kind of like brought this old pasta Norma dish into 2022. And it still hasn't really, you know, it hasn't been the, the we got a bit slow in getting it to market, but like, you know, they're the sort of things I really want to start doing. I'd love to like, you know, the next one we have is um, orecchiette broccoli con broccoli. So that's just, you know, orecchiette, the ear-shaped pastas. And it's an olive oil base with with smashed broccoli and chili and garlic. And, you know, it's – but some of these things are hard to bring to supermarkets on long shelf life. So we've the learning for us is how do we do that without, you know, uh, taking away the freshness and the quality of the, the mouthfeel of the product, for instance. You know, you can make Maintaining a product. that integrity. Yeah. So that's, that's probably been the biggest trick. There's some things you can do and some things you can't. I mean, mm-hmm. taking a sourdough that's 160 years old and going to – you know, I'm just wa- I've been walking to supermarkets and looking what can I what can I what can I supply here, and you can create it and do it, and you can go to market. Whereas with food service, you're kind of dictated to what's mm. I want this, I want that price. You know, bank you know, look supermarkets are price focused as well, but you know, for, for us doing um, fresh sourdough pizza dough that's from a 106 year old mother dough that's fermented for 48 hours with no added yeast and has natural yeast fermentation happening in it. It's like you put that on a supermarket shelf and you're a consumer and you go home and you go roll that ball out and you wait one hour to one hour and 15 or 20 minutes and you just use your hands and lots of flour and you just stretch it out and you bake that in your pizza oven or in your oven and, you know, and you bite into it and you can taste the sour. You know, mm. that it's not just a normal pizza dough that's left over from dough and they've put extra yeast in it and it blows up after five days. This thing doesn't blow up because it doesn't have added yeast. How do you get that message across? Ah, uh, that's the hard bit. Mm. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, we're focused so much on the products at the moment. Um, that's, you know, you know, and we're growing again. So we've, you know, we've gone from losing half our turnover when we lost supplying all those stores to now rebuilding our own turnover and our own business. And so what's that next step for us? Well, yeah, we probably start need to start looking at how we market ourselves. We've done social media. It's okay. Um, I think we've done a better job of what we did two years ago. But you can really see now that, you know, in looking at, you know, these other brands coming in like, you know, Renourish and Modern Me and, and South Yarra Deli, you know, they're serious about their business. You know, there's a serious marketing plan. There's a serious truth and values that they project in everything that they do. Aren't you serious about your business? Yeah, but I didn't communicate it like they did. Mm. We started off and just bumbled along and went in and we <laughs> we got some stuff. It's great. <laughs> and we we got another one. Um, now we need to get serious about our marketing and telling that story and communicating. So, you know, and I, I think the... Uh, the the way that I like to do it is probably mainly through PR. Well, we'll do it through this podcast. Good. We'll blast it out <laughs> everywhere. When you look at a product on the shelf or in the freezer, understanding the backstory does does change that value proposition? Definitely. Yeah. You you can see that now with you know, with the larger supermarkets, they're all going to sort of vanilla house brands. Um and it's funny to watch. Sometimes they go, we want brands in there, then we don't want them, and it changes. What's your view on that? If I came to you and I said, uh, this cannelloni, um, I'd like to have my label on that. Would yeah, you do it? Not, not anymore. No. I'd probably at a time when I was desperate, I would have. Yeah. <laughs> and you would. You know, yeah. if you're in business and you need the sales, yeah. you would do that. But like now. There's white papering. There's a lot of that happening. Yeah. And look, like now, why would I do it? I mean, I have a brand in that in that cannelloni. You know, we know where that ricotta comes from and that spinner comes from. The pasta's made here for that one there. Um, it's all made here. It goes in, in a at a tray that's not only recyclable, it's made from 80% recycled materials, cardboard that's, you know, part of the FSSC worldwide plantation program so we're not chopping down trees of significance and just using plantations for our cardboard. Um, You know, the tomatoes are from Australia. Imagine that, Italians making sugo from Australian tomatoes. You think about it. We've done it all our lives here in Australia. Every year we make the sauce at home for Australian tomatoes. I come in here and every Italian, oh, no, you can't use Australian tomatoes. We've got to use the tin tomatoes from Italy. So uh, come in here and go like, going, well, I don't know. You can get Australian tomatoes. We can just learn how to do it. So we mm. had to redevelop our recipes a bit, mm. but now we only use Australian tomatoes. So, yeah, making things from Australian ingredients is a really important part of us going forward. And I think it's, 
you know, it's really um, amazing. We, we thought of this before the supply problems. <laughs> and um, now we're so lucky we made that choice because it's really helping us. How are you doing your own um, distribution? Like, do you have your own trucks on the road? I... No, we contract the trucks out, but we okay. do distribute our, ourselves through them. So how are you, when you mentioned earlier about national distribution, how is that happening? So we'll, we'll use a, a national distributor. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's probably been the hardest thing to do is to find who that person is how they can do the whole of Australia, how they can get to independents that in supermarkets that are in faraway areas. Logistics in Australia is really expensive and it's a different business. And, you you know, we've had to learn how to compensate for that margin that's going to be gone and, and really understand... Um, I mean, I'm so lucky I have... Um, uh, Mark next to me in the office that actually understands every bit of the costs and things and we're together we we've both learned a lot but like um it was hard to just we you know we're we're right at the pointy end um these next few days to sign off on that and uh it, it's a that was the hardest thing to do but gee it, it's exciting well, well I can't believe how many whiteboards we've done over it <laughs> <laughs> well do you miss hospitality at all um always miss hospitality you made me a beautiful coffee. Thank you very <laughs> much. Right. I always miss it. But it comes back. We, we have a, a pop-up restaurant called Roberta's. Okay. And that kind of um, it's making its way back. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> oh, Roberto, it's been such a pleasure learning about your business and meeting you. And, and thank you for the tour of the facility as well. Thank you so much.